This is Dr. Mimi Lam from Metro Health Medical Center, and I would like to give you a brief introduction to the use of angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors. This class of drugs inhibits the activity of angiotensin-converting enzyme, or ACE, which normally converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angio 2 then acts on two types of receptors to produce a variety of actions covered in a previous video. The major uses of ACE inhibitors, which have names like lisinopril, enalapril, and captopril, are to treat hypertension, to decrease proteinuria, to decrease renal cell proliferation, apoptosis, and fibrosis, to treat heart failure, and to reduce myocardial hypertrophy, fibrosis, and ventricular modeling. Let's look briefly at each of these actions. By reducing systemic vascular resistance, ACE inhibitors are able to effectively lower blood pressure. From a practical standpoint, they are excellent drugs for treating hypertension because they are inexpensive, generally well tolerated, and usually need to be dosed just once a day. A unique advantage of ACE inhibitors is that because they dilate renal efferent arterioles, they decrease glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure which is good for intraglomerular vessels in the same way that decreasing systemic blood pressure is good for systemic blood vessels. This decrease in glomerular hydrostatic pressure is also believed to be the major mechanism behind ACE inhibitors' ability to decrease proteinuria. You can imagine that protein molecules find it easier to cross a damaged, leaky glomerular filtration barrier if they're swept along by filtrate at a high hydrostatic pressure. If hydrostatic pressure is lower, they are not carried through the filtration barrier as well, and so the amount of protein that gets into the urine decreases. Since proteinuria itself can actually contribute to renal damage, anything that reduces proteinuria is considered to be renal protective. Another way that ACE inhibitors protect the kidneys is by reducing cell proliferation, intercellular matrix generation, apoptosis, and fibrosis. ACE inhibitors are also valuable in treating heart failure, again because they reduce systemic vascular resistance. In other words, they reduce the afterload that the failing heart has to pump against, allowing an increase in ejection fraction and cardiac output. In addition to reducing afterload, ACE inhibitors can help the heart by reducing myocardial hypertrophy and fibrosis. In clinical terms, this means preventing or decreasing what is called ventricular remodeling, the process by which ventricular walls may become either too thick, for example due to long-standing hypertension, or too thin and fibrotic from ischemic injury. Both of these types of changes can impair myocardial function and contribute to heart failure. On the other hand, the same properties of ACE inhibitors that make them such effective therapeutic agents can also result in unwanted and sometimes harmful side effects, and we will go over several of them which are listed here. For example, the same decrease in glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure that protects intraglomerular vessels and reduces proteinuria can be enough to significantly reduce GFR, which can be bad, especially in patients whose GFR is already low because of chronic kidney disease. Another potentially dangerous side effect of ACE inhibitors is hyperkalemia, because when angio-2 synthesis is prevented, so is aldosterone synthesis which then impairs potassium uptake into renal tubular cells and secretion through potassium channels into the collecting tubule to be excreted in the urine. For these reasons, ACE inhibitors should be used with caution in patients with CKD. And if a CKD patient is started on an ACE inhibitor, the BUN, serum creatinine, and potassium should be closely monitored in case GFR takes a dive or hyperkalemia develops. And although the antiproliferative effect of ACE inhibitors is helpful in reducing myocardial hypertrophy and renal cell proliferation, it may also have the not-so-helpful effect of making anemia worse by reducing the production of red blood cells. Now, in order to understand the last two side effects listed here, let's look in more detail at the actual ACE pathway. Notice that not all angio-1 gets converted to angio-2 via ACE. A small amount is converted by an enzyme called chymase, so even with an ACE inhibitor, some angio-2 can still be formed. Also, ACE has another role. 
it degrades the vasodilating inflammatory mediator bradykinin. So using an ACE inhibitor blocks this degradation, resulting in more bradykinin sticking around. And this is believed to be the mechanism of two well-known ACE inhibitor side effects, angioedema, which produces swelling of the face, lips, and tongue, and it can be quite serious and even life-threatening, and the more commonly occurring cough, which is usually non-productive, worse at night, and annoying to the patient. Finally, let's look at how ACE inhibitors can interact with angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, and think about what happens when they are used together. Note that the suppression of angio-2 synthesis results in the loss of its usual negative feedback on renin, so renin levels rise when an ACE inhibitor is used. Since the activity of the ACE inhibitor may begin to wear off near the end of its dosing interval, this increased renin level can drive production of angio-2 through the incompletely blocked ACE pathway, and along with the A2 already produced via the kinase pathway, can render ACE blockade less effective. So the addition of an ARB may help to block the action of any angio-2 that happens to get through or around the ACE inhibitor barrier. ARBs block AT1 receptors so that any angio-2 that is around gets shunted towards AT2 receptors. These receptors are fewer in number than the AT1s so that they tend not to have a significant effect under normal circumstances. But when their activity is unmasked by an AT1 receptor blocker, they are seen to have opposite effects to the AT1s. They induce vasodilation instead of constriction, and they decrease cell proliferation instead of increasing it. Thus, the combination of ACE inhibitors and ARBs makes pathophysiologic sense, although it may also increase the risk of side effects such as decreased GFR and hyperkalemia. So in summary, ACE inhibitors are a very useful and generally well-tolerated class of drugs with a variety of cardiac and renal effects. However, their usefulness can be limited by certain side effects. Finally, please be aware that in this brief discussion of the good and bad aspects of ACE inhibitors, we are just looking at the tip of the iceberg and that there are many more things to read and learn about this complex and fascinating class of drugs.